Yes. This, we, uh, I thought are. I knew, I thought I knew not everything by Emmett Till, but enough about Emmett Till. There's more to know because of not so much what happened to him. What happened to him was pretty simple. 14 year old kid goes to the South. He's black kid goes to the South of Mississippi, 1955. He doesn't know the rules. It's not guaranteed that he's gonna have a, come to a, a, a tragic end, but his, more than likely not knowing the rules, stuff. especially given the insanity of the rules in Mississippi and the South generally in 1955. So looking at this through the eyes of his mother and what she went through in the aftermath of that tragic end of his, I asked a question. I wonder why not just black people, obviously, but people in general, but since we're talking about Emmett Till right now, black people specifically, why do they do this? Why during a time of great stress or in worship, do people lift their arms to God? Why do they scream to the sky? Why do they pour everything they have into a moment? So this is what we're seeing right here. But for example, why do I right now want to lift my arms to the sky? <laughs> because this has been this has been a, a feature of, of Christian worship. Again, generally speaking, Christian worship it is not at all unusual for people to lift their arms and praise, praise and worship to God, but specifically in moments of anguish. When people have no other recourse, when, they, when their initial response is not knowing what to do, when it's just purely visceral, reptilian, emotional, and there's nothing else they can grasp for. They reach for the ungraspable. They reach upward for the invisible, all-knowing, all-seeing, all-encompassing, all-powerful God. Because somehow in that impossibility of trying to grab him, they grab on to the reality that there's something beyond them that can quite possibly explain the anguish that they're in. That ends up being, for me, the most rational possible explanation for what a mother must feel when she realizes that her son has not only been murdered, but murdered the way the Emmett Till was, was. How do you explain that? You cannot explain that. There's no rational way of making sense out of that. How people can A, do that to a human being, Second, how they, do, how they can do that to a child, and B, how they can do it for the reason that they did it. Emmett Till existed. That was his crime. Just like in Nazi Germany, six million Jews die. Why? Because they made the mistake of being born. And somebody considered that to be a problem. So they do it. And they've done it often since 1619. They've done it, they do it today for reasons that are connected to, separate from, apart from, but connected to that long arc and trajectory of history. I suspect that in some way or form or fashion, because we know that in, in a lot of West African religions, that at least my professor, Dr. Felix Akichi at Kent State, used to talk about the the, the, the belief of the Arachuku, the sky god. There was a, a system of Arachuku, who was, the, who was the superior god, the senior god, and then he had his, his other helper gods. Now, we call God the, the Trinity. There's God in the, the heavenly council, angels. So in that, in that cosmology, you know, you're doing a parallel setup. There's the senior. Then there's those who help him. So it's kind of like a one-to-one, -one, but culturally, Lama Sana would say that, you know, as a missionary, 
if you want people to understand that Western model, we have to put it in terms that people within their culture can understand it. That doesn't mean that the Western model isn't true. It's just that if you want people to adopt their Christian model, you have to give it to them in a way that they can understand it and explain it that way. And that way it helps them understand. So all that just to say that somehow if they're raising their arms to God, they must have been raising their arms to God for sure. And they're driven below decks on slave ships and arranged like this. Seeing this convinces me, tells us, assures us that this transatlantic slave trade was not some type of haphazard affair. Just like nobody would build a house and not know, not have any blueprints, you know what you're gonna do because you know how the way, where you want the rooms, how many, how many rooms you want, skylights, the whole thing. So just as there's, there's a plan, likewise, there was a plan, which means there's intentionality, which means there's purpose, which means there's a system. There's a system in operation here to get as many aboard. And there were two general, two general ways of doing this, tight pack, loose pack. If you have a ship of 100, I'll keep it in round numbers because I'm an historian. <laughs> if you have a ship of 100 people and you know that each voyage you're gonna lose 10 people, then what you do is you pack 110 into the ship. It's already miserable with 100 people. 10 more people guarantees you that if you lose 10, well, you weren't gonna have those 10 anyway, but if they survive, you get 10 more that add to your profit margin. Now, if you call yourself a humane ship captain, you might pack only 90 on there. You're gonna give them a little bit more room. Well, you might lose a few, but you'll, you won't end up losing as much as you would have lost if you had them jammed together like this in the hot, humid, stinking, fetid, disease-ridden confines for people, many of whom who had never seen the ocean before, although many of them coming from the air of Niger probably saw the Niger River, which is a very, very big river, bigger than the Mississippi. So still not an ocean, but they've seen big bodies of water. I suspect that they must have raised their hands during the trauma of the Middle Passage when sometimes slave ships ran out of food and so they tossed people overboard. because nothing was more important than getting the product to market. And if we're gonna understand what happened to Emmett Till, if we're gonna understand this, this process right here. I always tell my students that before we can start talking about the systems of slavery, the, the functionalities of auctions and the underground rail, before we do anything, you must first, last, and always come to terms come to grips with the fact that this was always about money. Now, when you ask yourself the question, what will human beings do for money? The answer is, or more specifically, is there anything human beings won't do for money? And the answer is a very quick no. We have seen just in the last 48, 24 hours about you know, some migrants who were what? Abandoned an attractive trailer down in Texas. Clearly people will smuggle human beings for money. I just came back from Vietnam about a, just a month ago now, where there was talk of uh, the, the trade of young women and boys in the sex industry throughout Southeast Asia, particularly in Thailand, Laos, Cambodia. We understand that during the World War II, the Nazis were corrupt, of course, in addition to everything else that was so odious about them. There's nothing that human beings won't do for money. And of course, the primary, the, 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 the pinnacle example of what, what will human beings do for money in the category of there's nothing they won't do is the, the selling, the framing, selling, humiliation, torture, and assassination of a purely innocent man for 33 pieces of silver. If you can do that, there's nothing you won't do. Nothing you won't do. Nothing you won't do. They raised their hands, I believe, during those long summers in between the cotton rows. Like Sojourner Truth said, or as Dr. William Myers down at Ashland Theological Seminary said, one time when I heard him do a presentation, he said that Sojourner Truth, whose children had been sold from her, hither and yon, and she never knew where they went, and she prayed to God until her heart was about to burst, asking for relief. And as he said that, he believes that somewhere out there between the cotton rows, 
the grace of God gave her the ability to say, Lord, you know what? I can love even the white folks. After all they've done to me, after they've abused my people. And Dr. Meyer says that in that moment, she was filled with this unbelievable love for her oppressors, which helped her see them as not just these beasts who were oppressing her, but human beings that had their own challenges, that deserved love as well, despite what they were doing to her. And somehow that space of love gave her the ability in the raising of her hands to, to the sky to pray for them too. I think that they, were, they raised their hands during moments when like the guy on the right, his name, slave named Peter, who whatever his, 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 his personality, he clearly was not submitting very easily. And the evidence was there. And so during those moments when, and the caprice of the slave system was such that you could be beaten for anything. Usually the, 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 the favorite, as Frederick Douglass said in his 1845, narrative, the favorite one was impudence. And what was impudence? Anything you needed it to be. Not moving fast enough, not looking up fast enough, making eye contact, not getting off the sidewalk. It could be whatever your imagination, whatever the imagination could think of, that's what impudence was. I think that they raised their hand to God during that long four-year conflict from April 9th, 1861 until April 12th, 1865, when if you can believe this, and we have to believe it because it happened, that America, this democratic constitutional Republican democracy, actually spent four years in a destructive fatricidal conflict that introduced the world's first modern war over an issue called slavery. Basically, I'm gonna spend four years fighting you tooth and nail to decide one question. I have the right to own, use, and dispose of another human being in any way that I want. Now last week, the last time we got together, Paul gave me a book about how Southerners were educated. It's primer for, I think, using grade school. And I read that book between then and now. <laughs> and well, it's a good thing that I read it when I was mostly you know, hiking in the woods so people couldn't hear me cussing. <laughs> because I said, if this is how Southerners were taught, it's no wonder we have such a distorted warped view, the way it was cherry picked and so on. And I am convinced at this point that people that need for the Civil War to be about anything other than slavery, they do that not because it either was or wasn't about slavery, but if you land on the fact that the Civil War is about something other than slavery, or more specifically, if you land on it and say that, yes, that's what it was. Then what you also then have to agree with, I think logically is that it was a system of slavery, which means it was systemic, which means that it was an economic system, an economic system that was supported by a political system and a culture that tolerated it and a culture that was so infused with racism, you made all these things that racism existed, that was already in the DNA and the ecosystem, it was always flowing through, it sustained, elevated, protected, and perpetuated the system called slavery. If you admit all that, then you also eventually had to confront the fact that America had and has a problem. Systemically. Not accidentally. Systemically. Because nothing in America, either as a nas nascent capitalist nation or a capitalist nation, and let's be very clear about this, slavery was industrial agriculture capitalism style. People in America don't do anything for 246 years that isn't profitable. And it was profitable, wildly profitable, so profitable so that Southerners, not Northerners, not Frenchmen, not the British, Southerners called their product King Cotton. They called themselves the Southern aristocracy. These are the names they gave to themselves because of the great wealth that the system gave to them. They fashioned themselves or saw themselves being in the American image of feudal landlords and aristocrats. And then they modeled their behavior and attitudes and culture to mimic that as best they could. So the hands went up for four years over that great battle to dismantle that thing. The hands went up 
or the great battle to dismantle it because black men trying to get into the fight to end the fight had to fight to be allowed to fight. And then when the thing ended, there were new things to lift your hands about. There was reconstruction that lasted for 12 years, a 12 year window of a sort of respite because it never really did actually take root, never, never really did get traction. They tried really hard. They passed the 13th Amendment, which got rid of the problem. But Southerners, for the moment that the last shot was fired before the dust settled and the smoke cleared, Southerners were already looking for a way to end run the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. And again, Southerners understood then, and people who are interested in acquiring power now, or maybe to rephrase that for a more appropriate application to our contemporary moment, people who are interested in making sure that power is shared by just a very few people. They understood that the way to do that was to limit the greater number of people from the ballot box. So they pulled every trick they could, gerrymandering, corruption, terrorism, to tell people, sure, you have the right to vote, but if you vote, what's more important to you, your vote or your life? If you're not alive, it doesn't matter anyway, does it? Not really. People got the message because people may be illiterate, but literacy and intelligence are two different things. One is untrained, one's got possibilities. So they needed an arm for the terrorism. And the arm for the terrorism was the person on the right, the people that dressed up in sheets and hoods, the domestic terrorists, the ones who I have come to view them as being, I don't know why, I, I don't know why I never did this before, but I finally come into a realization that they are no different than Al Qaeda, than ISIS, or the, the terrorist armies or the terrorists of the 1970s, the 1960s. So I think the reason why they raised their arms, why Emmett Till's mother raised her arms, she had to raise her arms. How could she not raise her arms? I think the reason why they raised their arms is because they know, they hope, they've been told there's something inside their spirit. There are people, there are of course people who deny that God exists, but there's this other part where you, know, you can't deny your own existence. And part of our existence is that we are also spiritual creatures. This is what I choose to believe that as a spiritual, spiritual creature, we recognize, even if we don't understand, if we can't understand a thing, even if we cannot articulate it, there's something beyond us that we need in a moment of crisis, like when your 14-year-old son is killed because he exists. And Mamie Till raised her hands because somewhere in her upbringing, somewhere, somehow, someone had repeated to her and she remembered. She remembers some preacher taking Psalm 138.6 and paraphrasing it, saying, you know, in the black preacher's voice, we know that God sits high and looks low. We know that God was the one, this is the same Jehovah, Yahweh, who went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. Who told Moses that he's not going to do it, but I need, for him to, I need for him to do that, showing his power so that I can show you my power. So when he does that, then I'm going to show him. And when I show him by that example, you will know when he will know who I am, that you can trust me. And when it comes after you in the desert, I'm going to be a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And then when you get hungry, I'm going to feed you with manna. And when you complain about that, I'm going to bring you, I'm going to bring you quail. You're going to get dissatisfied with me. You're going to want judges. I'm going to give those to you too, so you can learn for yourself that it's better to have me as your leader than them. Samson will prove to you that as great as he is, he's got problems. I'm going to do a lot of things for you. I'm going to bring a woman of questionable social value who's going to be a major participant in the line of David, who's going to bring, who's going to be part of that same genealogy, who's going to deliver the one who's going to deliver you. That's who I am. So she remembered. Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly. But the proud 
he knoweth afar off. This is the God that sits high and looks low. The God who, when he decided to make his entry on earth, it wasn't in a royal palace, it wasn't in a mansion, it was in a barn. Maybe Till did that because somehow something in her and the people of her culture and other Christians have known time immemorial through times of great struggle. There's this understanding, this belief, this, this awareness, and, and, and this actuality where they knew that when they reached up, there was a flaming hand of liberation re reaching down. This is not an inactive God. This is not a wooden God or a stone God. This is a God who, though he not be seen, is somebody that is actively involved so deeply involved in the lives of the people that he's concerned about, he takes time to number the hairs on your head. Well, yeah. <laughs> he gets involved. So there are no words. There are no words that Mamie Till could use to speak. No words of anguish that she could cry. Nothing that she could say that would appropriately, completely, accurately express her anguish at not just losing her son, but losing her son to these murderers who did it with such, such brutality and in a culture and an environment where she and her community knew that people had done this over and over and over again and gotten away with it, scot-free, never been questioned, never went to jail, and something inside of her must have told her that because this happened in Mississippi, the worst of all the states where such, where such a thing could happen for a 14 year old black kid from Chicago to make such a mistake or any kind of mistake, according to the twisted rules down there, something must have told her that there was a better than 90% chance, a better than 100% chance that they were going to get away with it. And eventually, of course, they did. How does a mother express her anguish about that? How does the mother protest that? What words does she use? What language does she invent? What language can she use to express that? What can she do but lift her hands to the sky and pray to the one that has the, all, the flaming hand to reach down? And if nothing else, if he can't stop her anguish, to take her own life so that her pain can end. No words. She remembered him before. And she would never forget Emmett Till. Of course, how could she? She had literally pushed him out of her body. The first time she saw him, she would never forget it. She got to enjoy him for 14 years. That great flaming hand of relief who had the words to articulate for her what she could not express herself was with her when she saw the body, when they recovered it from Mississippi. The sheriff, H.C. Strider, tried to bury the body before she could get it back to Chicago. Literally tried to bury the evidence before the world could see it. He must have known there must have been an inkling that we can't have this get out. We can't let the world see this. If the world, if the world sees us like this, then they'll think ill of us. Like, really, Sheriff Strider, you don't need anything else to make the world view, any, view you any worse. This is just confirm what we know. The great eye of the cosmos was with her on the day of the funeral. The great eye of the cosmos was with her the day they brought the body back. 
the great eye of the cosmos. And obviously I can't know if she actually thought these things at the moment, but I'm gonna guess that in those moments when she couldn't find those words, when she couldn't invent the language, that her, her tradition, she was hoping really, really hard that if there is a God out there, can you be here in this moment right now, helping me make sense of all this? Can you, look, never mind next week. Can you just help me get from this moment to this one? Can you just help me do that? Because somewhere in that box is my little boy. She would not be comforted. Comfort's not what she wanted. In our own time, during the Vietnam War, people, people could, of course, nobody ever likes to see a loved one die or have a loved one die. But one of the things about Vietnam was this, if we, look, if you could just if maybe understand what this is all about. Okay, nations go to war, women and men die. And that's just, that stinks. That's the way of the world. That is the world that we live in and it won't change soon enough. It may change someday, but today's not that day. But can you at least just tell me what the fight is all about? So that when I go visit the grave, it makes some sense. So that it wasn't pointless. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission, after apartheid fell in South Africa, it wasn't to arrange the deaths. They could not do that. It's so that the people on both sides who suffered the loss of loved ones could make some sense out of why their loved ones had to die. Now, why did this have to happen? Can you just make me understand? During the process of this funeral, I have surmised that Mamie Till changed. My older sister Yvonne passed away last November. She and I were not on the best terms the last part of her life, but in the last, ever since then, it's been what, eight months now? And I have been struck by the fact that, wow, I really love that girl. And I was better with her here than with her gone. And I tried hard to repair that bridge, but I wish I worked harder. I wish she had worked with me. So a loss would change you. This loss changed her. The depth of the loss, the breadth of the loss, the type of the loss, it's in her face. That, fa that same face is a face that also occasionally smiled. So it had the capacity, but the loss of her son. And seeing her face like that, seeing her face sent ripples throughout the community 
and across the nation. Just imagine the conversations. Can you believe that they, what, how old was that boy? 14 years old, what did he do? They said he whistled, That's one, that was one version. They said, they, they said he said, hey baby, that's two words. Wait, let, let me get this straight. He whistled? Yeah. He said two words? Yeah. And they killed him? Yeah, and how'd they kill him? Well, they went to his grandfather's house or his uncle's house and busted in. Wait, wait. They went to the father's, to the uncle's house at nighttime and they didn't break it in or they just barged inside and rampaged through the house asking, where's that boy that did all that talking? What, the two words? Yes. The one who whistled? Yes. What talking are they talking about? And the uncle tried to reason with them and said, look, he's only 14 years old. He's from Chicago. He doesn't understand the rules of, of, of what's going on down here. And he found him and dragged that boy out of bed. He was sleeping, not falling asleep. He's sleeping, dragged him out of bed. And the way, and the way William Bradford Huey told the story later on, when he interviewed the two murderers who got away with it, they told him that he didn't seem afraid enough. He clearly did not understand the danger he was in. And when they asked him what it was he'd done, he told them, one of them, I think it was J.W. Milam, said, boy, you were never going to see the light of day again. Then they tied a cotton gin fan around his neck. That was after they beat him and took a 45 and put a bullet in his head. They tied the cotton gin fan around his neck and threw him into the Tallahatchie River. Now, the model M1911 45 hand pistol was designed and built after the Philippine insurrection of 1899 to 1901, 1902, because during the Philippine insurrection, the Moros, who were part of the Filipino, who were a people in the Philippine islands, they charged American soldiers with a kind of fierce ferocity. They thought they were on drugs. So in close quarter combat, they would shoot them with their regular hand, 38 caliber handgun, and these people kept coming. So the 45 was designed to do what they call stopping power. You get hit with a 45 round, you are not going to get up. That's what they use on Emmett Till, that kind of weapon, or 45, for sufficient stopping power. So let me get this straight. That boy was 14 years old. Yes. Where's he from? Chicago. Where was he? In Mississippi. And you say he whistled? That's what they say. We spoke two words? That's what they say. And they killed him for that? Very dead. Lord have mercy. Yes. Lord have mercy indeed. Please have mercy, because Emmett Till didn't get any, not any at all. How is Mamie Till with the men her broken heart? Her broken heart that by the time of Emmett Till's death had already been broken by two men. She'll marry a third time, so that, that romantic heart will has some type of some type of comfort brought to it, but this mother's heart, that's not going to get fixed. I don't, I don't know that there's enough time to fix something like that. My sister Deborah passed away in 2005. Deborah was adopted. My father adopted her as a favor to a friend of his during the Vietnam War because he had a friend who had been messing around on her husband and the husband was a rather abusive character. So she knew that the husband came back from Vietnam and found out that she was pregnant. She's probably gonna beat her into the earth. So she had the baby before he could get back and my father adopted her and Deborah was just my sister. That's all we knew her as, my sister. I have another sister that was still born Anitra, never saw her. 
at the funeral, I was five years old. Everybody was crying. I didn't know what was going on, but everybody was crying. I figured like, you know, five-year-old, I better cry too. So I did. <laughs> I grew up with five sisters. The next neighbor I adopted. There were five of them. I've lost three now. When you're growing up, you don't like sisters. <laughs> now, I need more sisters. <laughs> but even though I didn't know Anitra, that isn't fixed. And I spent 17 years missing Deborah and eight months missing Yvonne. And again, I'm going to guess that somehow in Mamie Till's agony, at some point, as she was as she was rounding that corner to figure out what am I going to do next? Because you know, there's always if you're if you're alive, there, there's also the there's always the question whether you whether you're consciously asking or not. If if the sun comes up and you're still here, you are forced to respond to the question. Well, what do I do now with the new day? If you're not going to kill yourself, you live into the day. So what are you going to do with it? What do you do now with the new day? And if in fact she asked that question by conscious expression or just by being alive, what am I gonna do in the new day? At some point during that process of turning that corner and getting to the new, new day and say, what do I do now? There comes a moment in a tragedy where if you were aligned the way she was aligned, lost a son the way she lost, you may be reminded that, you know what? There's someone else who lost a son who knows exactly what that feels like. Someone else lost a son. And it's saying, hey, hey, Mamie, I, you know what? I'm not just feeling you. I'm knowing you. I know exactly what that feels like. I got your back and I got you here. In other words, I understand. And I'm not saying I understand like, you know, some type of intellectual, you know, I'll be there for you. Let me know what you need. I'm talking about, I understand every tear you shed, every scream you, every scream you didn't utter, every word you can't speak, I totally get where you are. I understand. Then after that moment, what now? Mamie Till has to ask. What do you do now? What do you do when people have murdered your one and only son? It wouldn't have been better if she had three or four, but on the other hand, she had just the one. Just the one. She's been through two marriages. So clearly, romantic life has some challenges. How many more opportunities will she get to get married and have, a, and have children as time moves on and her body begins to betray her? And having children is impossible. Or does she want children anymore? Does she want any more children? Does she want to bring any more children? Even if she ch can or chooses to, does she want to bring any more children into the United States of 1955 that can do that to a 14-year-old boy from Chicago who doesn't know the rules of the game? Well, the only, other, the only other thing to do was to, was to have the trial. The trial, consider having a trial in this kind of environment. We were gonna show you this last week. And now last week, I was gonna use this to help you understand the atmosphere in 1955. Well, this is still the atmosphere in 1955. Now, I don't know if it's from the, it's from the year 1955, but it is from that era, okay? Imagine having a trial in Mississippi, and this is the mindset. If you just don't understand the connection that we have with the colored people. In other words, we, we work with them, and they work with us. And we're not gonna take him and push him off somewhere just because we could do it. 
You tell these people just what I've been telling them right here. Uh, had we been your friends for years? Yes, and, sir. Sure. And, uh, had we worked more of them than anybody in this country? Yes, sir. Sure. Sure have. Right. You, uh, you got hungry, we'd give you something to eat, don't we? Yes, sir. And his name is Billy Wilder. Well, Billy Wilder. Well, that's right. No relation now, but he's a weatherly right now. <laughs> How about him, Bill? Yes, sir. <laughs> Right that name, Mr. Bell. I respect that name. Probably that name, Mr. Bell. Yes, sir. Billy Wells. Yes, sir. Get up out of there, Bill, a little well. Yes, sir. Let me see. Bill, Bill. Billy, you're in Pine Hill tonight at 12 o'clock. You could go ask them for help. They wouldn't help. Bill, you got in trouble. <laughs> I'm a bad person, Jack. Bill, put him on the spot, so there ain't no colorful pen. You don't want to see him bad right by itself. <laughs> <laughs> but is there anybody here that wouldn't have to be? No, sir. We uh, have always got along fine with the niggas. We never mistreated them. And there's no complaints. And they are all happy. Now, this is the 20th century. And clearly, technology is such that you have film, motion pictures with sound. So it's not the ancient period we're talking about. This is from that era. This is the environment where Emmett Till was killed or where Emmett Till's trial is going to be held by a jury of his peers. And in the commentary, you hear there the assumption, the presumption of ownership and entitlement. And Judy, you mentioned it last week, this culture of, uh, of impunity. We give them this, we let them do that. As long as they behave, we let them do X and we provide them with thus. The paternalism, they're not, they're not, they don't have enough agency to take care of themselves. It's the plantation system upgraded for the 20th century. And by the way, that mentality lives. If you guys don't understand. Then there was this character. Now this is from later on after Emmett Till has been murdered and the trial's been had and his murderers have been let go. But this is Eugene Theophilus, Eugene Bull Connor. In the early 1960s, the man who was the one who gave the order for the water cannon being used on the marches in Birmingham. You can never whip these birds if you don't keep you and them separate. You've got to keep the white and the black separate. Let the law enforcement agencies, that's what you've got them hired for. And the governor of the state of Alabama ha uh, handle this thing. Now, George asked me to ask you to do that. Do him one. He says, now, George asked me some of George Wallace, the governor. Tell your friends when you leave here between now and Tuesday, don't go up there. Leave it alone. They're going to handle this situation. Just leave it alone. You know? Those Kennedys, up there in Washington, that little old Bobby Sox and his brother, the president, <laughs> they'd give anything in the world if we had some trouble here. If we don't have any trouble, we can beat them at your own game. You can, you can... If we just hold the line, and keep those northerners and their Jewish lawyers from coming down here and messing with stuff, we'll be all right. I'm a historian of the Civil War. That cultural belief is markedly the same as what Robert E. Lee felt and what Jefferson Davis, our graduate of West Point and a former war secretary, wanted to use during the Civil War. If we can, there's the, the there's the north up there. And here's the divine line between north and south. 
So there's something tactically militarily called interior lines. We have the advantage of interior. If they invade here, we know where all the rivers and swamps and mountains and trees and so forth, so forth are. They'll be on our territory. If they just stay right where they are and, and let us hold the line, we just hold the line and keep them there, we can become an independent nation. Robert E. Lee adopted the same kind of principle. It was called the offensive defensive. We want to have the war fought not here in the South. So to keep them up there, let's take the war up there to them. There'll be a, there'll be a battle called Antietam in Western Maryland in 1862. Then another one called Gettysburg in the summer of 1863. When they fight up there, if we fight them up there. First of all, we're fighting them up there and not down here. We're holding the line. We're gonna be defensive by taking the war to them. So no, President Davis, let's not just stand right here and hope for the freight, hope for the better. Lee says, let's take it to them and then exhaust them. Make the Northern populace so afraid, so weary of war, they'll just say, you know what, fine, go ahead. Hold the line, hold the line. We don't want anybody coming down here getting in our business. They don't know how we live, what we do, what the rules are. They killed their son. Then the call came. Emmett's body had been found. And it made me start crying and yelling. And we didn't know what had happened. The grief in the house, the sadness in the house was horrible. The screaming the disbelief. Mamie was just devastated. It was hard to see her heart broken. But she had to pull herself together because she had to get the mechanisms in place to bring him back to Chicago. Now the Tallahatchie County Sheriff, H.C. Strider, orders that Emmett's body be buried immediately before the sun sets that day. The grave is actually being dug when Mamie gets the information that they're about to bury her son in Mississippi. First of all, why is the sheriff even making that decision? When have you heard of a sheriff deciding that the body should be buried? There's something really, really that they're trying to hide here. For his mom, that was an immediate red flag. She set off a domino effect. Miss Mamie began to call everybody she knew. She called the governor, she called Mayor Daly, she called everybody she could touch and finally got them engaged to, to bring the child home. The stopping of the burial came from Illinois. Chicago Mayor Daley, who had just become a mayor, they stepped up and got that stop. The same train that took him down, the city of New Orleans train, brought his remains back to Chicago. The night they brought Emmett's body back from Mississippi, everybody went down to the train station. The body came in, I understand, a, a wooden seal box. Her uncle and authorities had signed an agreement that the casket would be sealed. 
Why would Mississippi want a sealed casket? Hmm. Emma's mother said, well, give me a crowbar, give me whatever. What can they do to me? They've taken my son. What could they charge me with anyway, breaking and entering? I didn't care. The Mississippi officials were the ones with something to hide. What on earth was it? What was I about to witness? It's powerful and it's, it was history changing. That one little act of, I'm gonna see my son, I'm gonna see my son's face, literally changed history as we know it. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking. Roy Bryant is on the left. He's the one whose wife, Carolyn Bryant, Emmett Till allegedly says something to him, his half-brother, J.W. Milam, on the right. They went to trial, and at the trial, I found something on PBS.org talking about the atmosphere of the trial. People were cracking jokes like this one. Wasn't it just like a you-know-what to try and cross the Tallahatchie River with a gin fan around his neck? So they're telling jokes like this at the trial, where people are. And Emmett Till's uncle, Mose Wright, the eyewitness, the man who was there the night that the twos, those two thugs came to the house and dragged their boy out. Mose Wright recalled that he told J.D. Malam, look, this boy, he's only 14, and he's from up north. Why not give the boy a whipping and leave it at that? Now, Let's, 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 let's analyze this. You break into my house at night, grab my nephew, and my compromise to you is just give the boy a whipping and let it go at that. that. That by itself is offensive. The fact that they thought they had the authority to do that and could get away with it. I'm gonna break into your house, beat your nephew, teach him a lesson while you're standing there watching you, the accountable, responsible adult, I say you to stand there and do nothing while I administer this corporal punishment in whatever form may come to whatever degree it may be given. For I don't know about you, but that's called ultimate power. You can break into a person's house and beat their children. And all you can do is stand there and watch. You don't have a whole lot going for you in that society, in that culture. The, the, the same forces that tell you that it's possible to have one of yours swinging from a tree and no one will do anything about it. They're not, those same do nothing about it will be present in that very moment too, or they're beating your children in front of your face in the house that they broke into that you own. Mo's Wright's wife, Elizabeth, offered them money. Here's the second point of ridiculousness. Let me get this straight, you broke into my house. You want to take my nephew out and beat this boy. How about if I give you money to not do that? So I'm, I'm trying to buy you off because that may keep you from beating my nephew, but it also acknowledges the fact that you think you have the right to beat my nephew and that I have to, find, I have to pay some kind of tribute to you to prevent that which says something about who you are and who I'm not. And then if you take my money, that means I don't, I'm not entitled to my money or my nephew either. During the antebellum period, meaning from before 1865, before slavery ended, black people were not allowed to earn a wage. They were not allowed to have, they weren't allowed to have access or authority over their children. How much is different in this scenario? They seized them at Till. J.W. Milan tells, says to Mose Wright, the uncle, you are a preacher, right? How old are you, preacher? 64. If you make any trouble, you never live to be 65. These are the words of an individual who knows. I can break into your house at night. How do I know this? Because I've done it. I can kidnap your nephew. Okay, so there's, kid, there's, there's breaking and entering, burglary, breaking and entering, forcible entry, Kidnapping, those are worth both of those. One of those is worth a lot of time in jail, but now you've done two. Intimidation, 
How old are you? 64? If you say anything, you'll never see 65. Translation, I'm about to take this boy and do whatever I'm going to do to him. And your imagination will fill in the blanks. And guess what? There's nothing you can do about it. And there's nothing you better do about it. Or else you'll be next. That is a society that says, I have the power to break into your home at night, kidnap your children, take your money, commit forcible entry, murder your relatives, and there's nothing that the laws passed by politicians and the law that's supposed to be enforced by the local sheriff who won't, and the society that's supposed to be appalled by this kind of thing, there's nothing that's going to come to your aid or rescue now or then afterward. And you know what? I'm even going to admit to William Bradford Huey that I did it and nothing's going to happen. So you tell me what's stopping me from taking out this revenge upon this boy from Chicago? There's nothing. And our challenge is to understand, to come to grips with, to confront the fact that, to own the fact that once upon a time in the United States, this was the reality for a certain segment of the country. Thank God it isn't like this now, but once upon a time it was. And as Anthony Hopkins said, playing John Quincy Adams in the movie Amistad a few years ago, when he said, who we are is who we were. It is the force of history, which is why, the, which is why history must be told accurately. Even the part that we don't wanna know about, it's not all bad, but I've always said, if all you can do in your relationship with the United States is embrace and love the good parts, you don't have a full scale relationship because no relationship is without its problems. If you love the country, then you love it warts, dark spots and all. And where it's not good, then get busy fixing it. You too can run for Congress and get three votes. <laughs> So how is it possible for a thing like this to happen? How is it possible for a thing like this to happen? Is it, well, gee, Fred, is that a rhetorical question? Not at all. It's possible because this is the same if you, if you, I mean, seriously, you ask that question, are you serious? The arc of American history suggests to us that, that, that breaking and entering, breaking into Moses Wright's house at night, kidnapping his son, being offered a bribe to not kidnap the kid, and then threatening you, intimidating you, and then telegraphing very clearly you, you intend to commit murder or at least some type of corporal punishment or some type, of, some type of assault at a minimum. That's possible because of the long arc of American history, which includes, among other things, within the Constitution, Article 1, Section 2, Paragraph 3, the Three-Fifths Clause, which enshrines the guarantee of slavery. Article 1, Section 9, Paragraph 1, which tells the, the newly formed government before the ink is dried on the document that the Congress, not yet formed, will not be allowed to interfere with the transatlantic slave trade until the year 1808. But up until then, every such person imported will $10 could be gotten for that person, which automatically weds the US government to the transatlantic slave trade, getting it involved in the transatlantic slave trade and benefiting from it. And then Article 4, Section 2, Paragraph 3, the Fugitive Slave Clause that says, even if you run away from South Carolina to New York, where they may or may not have slavery, but even if it doesn't have slavery and their laws say to them that slavery is no longer legal here, you are still obligated to give your labor to the person that claims ownership of you in South Carolina, which means that it doesn't really matter where you go, you are not a free person. Your labor belongs to somebody else, no matter where you do it. So you are, in essence, in any state of the United States, you are not free of the states that are currently existing and those that will be added to the union. How's it possible? Because in 1830, the Congress passed and they were, they, they were absolutely serious when they did this, something called the Indian Removal Act. I give them credit for being flagrantly honest about the title, Indian Removal, where people, the Choctaw, Cherokee primarily, eventually the Seminoles, were moved from their ancestral homelands 2,000 miles across the United States at the point of the U.S. Army as an escorting service. If you're wondering why they're Cherokee in Oklahoma, that's not where they were originally from. They're there because they were forced to move there. 
the Cherokee tried to assimilate so well, they even started, they even, they even had a system of slaves, they even had black slaves among them. They were trying to fit in so well with larger society. That didn't work. You don't get it. You don't get it. You don't understand. You're an Indian. You can approach it, but you can't fit in. And we want this land. Why? Slavery must expand. How is it possible? Because in the 1840s, when Irish Catholics are coming to the United States, the newest wave of immigrants who will go through hell in America, we see cartoons like this one. Looks like alligators coming ashore. Those aren't alligators. Those are people in papal vestments. And the American River cancer. I mean, even in 1840s, people knew what cancer was. And of course, there's a narrative that, that would come very familiar. You see the staunch American there protecting the kids. We always must be, we don't want to, we, we must protect the children. Protect the children from this, these Irish Catholics and their, their Irish ways and their, 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 their odd culture and so on. How is it possible? Because like I mentioned, of the four year, the four year effect of settled conflict, about slavery, about slavery. Should we or shouldn't we have it? That's what it was fundamentally about. Fundamentally about. Do we or don't we have slavery in this constitutional democratic republic? How is it possible? Because when the fight over slavery didn't work out so well for the Southern half, they invented a history about the aftermath of slavery called birth of a nation. Reconstruction shows black men running around hiding behind trees, white men in black face who are running around pretending to be black soldiers, hiding behind trees that are drooling over very dainty flower throwing young, young white women. Because just in case you don't get it, you know they're lusty, brutish creatures. You must do all you can to protect womanhood, which will be a cause, a, a cause for having a good number of them swinging from poles and trees. And how is it possible? Because this movie, in 1915, we met with massive applause and approval and ovations in movie houses across the United States. And it will give birth a resurgence to a Ku Klux Klan that started in Pulaski, Tennessee, originally in 1866. It started out as a gentleman's club, they said, for Southerners who were just looking for something to do. It didn't take too long for them to figure out what their real purpose was. By the 1920s, when it's, re, when it's revived in 1915, by the 1920s, it is literally marching down Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. Did I not mention, did I, fail to, did I fail to state that in the background of the United States Capitol, you know that place where the nation sends its representatives, those people that speak for us to make laws and legislation. Now, if I'm a representative in that house of the people, and I got terrorists mar marching outside, and I'm okay with that, then the people who sent me there probably figure I'm okay with that because maybe they're okay with that. Am I going to pass laws to deal with that? Probably not. If I'm not passing laws to deal with this, then the people who are the terrorists probably figure that they can, you know, break into your house at night, kidnap your nephew, beat him up or kill him, and they know that nothing's going to happen because this is allowed, and it was allowed through the 1920s. How is it possible? Because not a Louisiana, not a Mississippi, not in Georgia, not in my home state of Virginia, but in Duluth, Minnesota. And then, of course, there was the famous one that I told you all about in Marion, Indiana in 1930. How is it possible? Because if I can do something like that, if I can be at the scene of that double homicide and look into the eye of the camera and tell you with my stare that nothing's going to happen to me because I know that, nothing's going to happen to me. No, they're not even going to question me. I'm, gonna get, I'm going to literally get away with murder with the mob. How can it not happen? So who cares? So what? So we got to ask the right question. Not how is it possible. The right question is, how was it not possible given that kind of history? Given those affairs, how could it not have happened? Moe's right here with Mamie Till and Emmett Till's cousin. He'll go to trial. And Moe's right, this is Mamie Till 
being interviewed outside the courthouse. You know, to America's credit, I mean, people were, people were appalled by that. Really? A 14-year-old boy? Yes, a 14-year-old boy. The mother's distraught. And then, let me just read here. Gerald Chatham asked Mose, right, Uncle Mose, do you see Mr. Milam in the courtroom? The audience fell silent, wondering if Wright would risk his life to accuse a white man in open court for a moment. No one moved. Now, look, it's not just, listen, it's, this is not talking about the audience fell silent, wondering if Mose Wright would risk his life to accuse a mafioso, a member of the, uh, of the mafia, or a member of the, of the mob, or a member of this gang or this cartel. No. To do that will cost you your life. But the, the linchpin here, the thing that could get you killed was to, you, are, you had to understand, Mose Wright, if you accuse a white, don't you understand? No black person does that. If you dare to accuse a white man, you are dead for sure. Excruciating tension filled the room while people waited for Wright's reply. Then in one of the most dramatic moments in Mississippi, in Mississippi trial, Moses Wright, a poor black sharecropper, stood up, raised his arm, pointed at Milam, a white man, and said, Dar ye. Wright then pointed at Bryant, identifying him as the man who had assisted in the kidnapping. Later on in Eyes of the Prize, Emmett Till's relative will say later on that he, it was many years later, he realized that his uncle was a hero. Justice in that moment was almost had, but it was slain by hate, fear, bigotry, the usual suspects that led to so many of these things happening in American history. <laughs> so so, so Mamie, Mamie Till now has, has lost a son and, and, and the trial. So the question comes again, now what? Now what does she do? Her heart is not gonna be healed. Emmett Till's not coming back. He's in the arms of God now. And justice has failed again. Now what? Now what do you do? You've gone through the system. You've been to trial. It failed you. It was gonna fail you. Now what? There's no punishment for the, for the breaking and entering. There's no punishment for the bribery. There's no punishment for the intimidation. There's no punishment for the assault. There's no, poor, there's no punishment for the murder. Now, what do you do if you're this boy's mother who's going to live with this every day? She started telling the story. She went across the nation, talking to audiences and explaining what had happened. Mamie Till's mindset was this. My son will not die for nothing. She told his story. She kept his flame alive. She eventually remarried. She went on to the University of Chicago, or School of Chicago, and got her education, got her master's degree as well. She became a teacher. For the next 40 years, she dedicated herself as an activist, educator to anything that would help advance the cause of civil rights and justice in the United States. She lived carrying the, the, the shadow and the memory of her son. Something, whatever changed her, whoever she had been, that murder changed her. Maybe she never would have given up in her, in her pursuit of things anyway. But after that, she absolutely was never going to give up. And you know, it's been said that the most dangerous people you can run into are the people that have nothing to lose. What do you threaten them with, victory? With that broken heart as her nuclear battery, it was gonna keep her animated until the very end of her life. This broken heart that would never be, it would never be resealed. It would never be completely whole again. It would always be broken and shattered. But in the strange way of things, this broken heart was the sustenance that took this and informed her as she became that. In a parallel scenario, that great eye that was sustained, that, that, that was with her during all that anguish, it was the, the brokenness of that moment for his own son that helped to bring some wholeness to the world. So broken things 
healed, wholeness coming after something being broken. Does it make logical sense? But it probably wasn't supposed to. My mother used to always say this. Now these two characters, what happened to them? J.W. Milam, did they ever go to jail? No, they didn't. But let me just go ahead and wrap up because I want to get some Q&A here. But J.W. Milam, the murderer on the left, he eventually died of cancer in 1980. Roy Bryant, the guy who owned Bryant's department store, or whatever, wherever the store was, or Carolyn Bryant, his wife was working the day that Emmett Till went in there and allegedly said something to her. <laughs> you got to love irony, right? They eventually had to close the store down because black people started boycotting the store for obvious reasons. So their economic livelihood depended upon the black community, the very community that they were assaulting. Now, I don't know about you, that is, that is tremendously lousy customer service. <laughs> A hundred days after Emmett Till's murder, or thereabouts, Rosa Parks made her move on the city bus in Montgomery, Alabama, which was intended. It was, a, it, was a, it was a plan by the local NAACP, just like Dred Scott in 1857 when he brought his case to trial. That whole thing was orchestrated by people that wanted to, that wanted to take a moment, an incident, and force it into the courts to have the courts make a decision on it. The Supreme Court failed in 1857. It succeeded in 1954, Brown versus Board. This also became a Supreme Court case. And in 1956, after the, after the Montgomery bus boycott, Montgomery City buses that depended upon black ridership for the line's viability were forced to desegregate. Also, during this boycott, there was a young 26-year-old preacher named Martin Luther King Jr. who was brought in by the Montgomery Improvement Association to lead the effort they thought that because he was young and inexperienced, they could easily manipulate him. Well, okay. In 1957, two years after Emmett Till's murder, Daisy Bates, she was kind of like the den mother for a group of people called the Little Rock Nine. Ever heard of them? The students who desegregated Little Rock Central High School. She met with them every day. Sustaining them because they were being harassed and abused and assaulted and maligned. Kids had to go to the having to go get the army to escort them to school. There's a very famous picture of Elizabeth Eckford who's walking in a mob of people, and there's a woman yelling at her. She became the face of American hatred and bigotry around the world. For the rest of her life, she would regret that. Nine years after Emmett Till, Fannie Lou Hamer. Are you all catching that all these are women? <laughs> right, Mamie Till, Daisy Bates, Fannie Lou Hamer would go to the Democratic National Convention as part of something called the Mississippi Democratic Freedom Party because the Mississippi Democratic Party would not allow her and other African-Americans to be part of their delegation. So they formed their own Freedom Party. And she gave a very famous speech on the floor of the convention. And Lyndon Johnson was running for re-election, he was running for election that year, the first time for his, for his own presidency. When Lyndon Johnson found out that she was gonna speak at the convention, back in those days when there were still only three channels, and Lyndon Johnson being the kind of powerful politician he was, he had enough clout to force her off the air. He made them go to commercial break. So they cut her off. But her speech was so powerful, they broadcast it the next day anyway, and thereafter. And they kept broadcasting it. So Lyndon Johnson, not the first time, shot himself in the foot. But she said, she said, I wonder, is this United States of America, we had to sleep with our telephone off the hook to be treated like decent human beings? She, she, was, she lived only just a few miles away from J.W. Milam and Roy Bryant. And Emmett Till's death was 10 years before this young John Lewis will lead a group of marchers across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in 1965. 
where they would have a thing called Bloody Sunday when the Alabama State Troopers, under the direction of George Wallace, would charge them and beat them to a pulp. John Lewis would suffer a, a, a concussion from this, a skull fracture. That's also the event, the era when Viola Liuzzo, a blonde white woman from Detroit, seeing that on TV, seeing what happened to those marchers, she will tell her family and her husband and her children, this is not the America I wanna live in. She drove down to Alabama and got there and said, what can I do to help? She started driving people around, people that didn't have transportation, helping. The Ku Klux Klan shot her in the head because as a white woman, she should, she should have known better. She had no dog in that fight, so they felt. The book that Mamie Till eventually wrote, Death of Innocence, the story of the hate crime that changed America. I've always, knew, I've always known that there was an intersection between Emmett Till's murder and Brown versus Board and Montgomery City bus boycott. But I think this was the hinge, this was the spark that lit the fuse that started the modern, re, the modern civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s and kind of flamed out after 1968 with uh, Dr. King's death. So the curse of Sisyphus was still with the United States and Mamie Till and her community. And it is still with us. It still is alive. She finally passed away on January 6, 2003. She married a third time, was happily married. So she finally found a guy who wasn't a jerk. And the truth of the matter is this, look, one of the things that upsets me, especially when I go back to the DC area and I hear people saying stuff like, uh, you know, this is just like slavery. No, it is not. No, it's not. Have things changed? Yes, they have. And for the better. But I'll tell you what, things have changed for the better and they still need and still can change for the better and will change for the better. But I have learned, I have been observing very closely the last couple of years, that this, the, this democracy is a lot more fragile than I thought it was, a lot more. We have work to do. It can change for the better, but the guardrails have been tested and they've been found wanting. So for that change to continue going in the, what I consider to be the right direction, we had to get busy. So thank you all for being interested in these kind of topics. Thank you for being such great citizens. And just thank you for you being you. Thank you. I've just a couple of things to yes. ask before we, before we start. We're taking roll today. And if you don't see your name checked off on the final column on here, would you do that, please? I've got many checked off if I knew who you were. But if you can do that for us, that would be helpful. Um, yes. And one other thing we have to, I would like to do now, we have a brand new director here at HASP and many of you maybe not have not met him. And I would be so happy if he would stand and give you a shout. We will be so happy that he is here. If you haven't met him, uh, please, please introduce yourself to him as soon as you can. Um, and before the questions, I know some people might have to leave, but they might stay, stay around. I have a shameless promotion for this fall's courses. Uh, Dr. Johnson is going to be teaching a great discussion course called the Changing Demographics in Our Global World, which is going to be fabulously interesting. And he also this fall is going to be teaching two sessions of critical race theory. So we're looking for to both of those. So now if you have questions, I have a microphone, just please raise your hand. Okay. How might this be related to white replacement theory? What's that? White em replacement. Em em Emmett Till's story? Yeah. Well, there's nothing, John, there's, there's nothing that is there, that, as far as I can, from what I know about Emmett Till and white replacement theory, that's directly connected, but let me put it to you like this. There's always been in that community of supremacists 
They've always had that as one of their, one of the things they're concerned about. You're not going to replace us. Jews shall not replace us, which is what that whole thing was about in Charlottesville in 2017. So there is, there is this thing called white replacement theory that through immigration and birth rate, white people will slowly be overwhelmed by this brown tidal wave. Now, demographers in the late 20th and early 21st century were saying that there, were, there, there would be taking place in the United States, not because of so many brown people being born, but you know, this, it, it's, it's the good news and the bad news was this, that people were becoming so, so less restrained by race, black people, white people, and otherwise and everybody in between, that they were falling in love and marrying with people, and having children with whoever they wanted. So you wouldn't get somebody, heavy quotation marks here, not purely black or purely white, a biracial United States. So they're calling it the Brownie of America. So through that process and through immigration and through birth rates, some declining, some increasing, uh, you would find this thing where you know, America wouldn't be, so the homogeneity that America had known for much of its history will begin to look different. Well, I think from my personal point of view, when in 2008, when Barack Obama was elected president, you have the son of a Kenyan father and a white woman from Kansas, okay? Now in America, it's always been the one drop rule. He had several drops. <laughs> and so, for many people of this mindset who were upset by this kind of thing, for them, the projection was that the brownie of America will be taking place by the year 2040 or 2050. 2008 was 42 years ahead of schedule. If a black man can become president of the most economically powerful, militarily powerful nation on earth, what else are they about to lose? Because for them, for all the millions of people that night saw it as a great achievement, you know, people were talking, you, you all remember all the discussion that we have finally become a post-racial America? I'm like, yeah, I'm not gonna go that far. But there was a great celebration and people should have been celebrating. But they've been reacting to that ever since. Because for them, this is happening too fast. Then all the other cultural changes that are going on, the, 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 the housing crisis and the economic change, challenges of the early 21st century, all these things, when people became economically sensitive and, 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 and harmed, they began looking at what immigration, of course, taking jobs, lowering wages, I mean, the usual stuff that people talked about. So this, the, the people talking about replacement theory, that's just one more thing they threw, on, they threw onto the pile of rubbish that they wanted to set a flame. That's what that's all about. Fred, we had a question from yes. our virtual partners. Uh, they were curious, uh, what was the federal response to Emmett Till's murder? We assume this predates hate crime uh, charges but was there a federal response or is this uh, rose to prominence following in, in a more historical context? That's a very good question. And I, okay, let me, let me, I think, I don't know how much of a federal response there was, but this was pretty much resolved at the state level, at the Mississippi state level. Okay, because let me draw a parallel here, Ian. When John Brown raided Harper's Ferry Arsenal in, in 1860, 1859, the federal government should have gotten involved because it was a federal arsenal. But James Buchanan, the lame president we had at the time, decided to leave it at, to leave it, to let Virginia resolve it. And it could only go one way because he knew that if the federal government got involved, it would limit John, it would limit Virginia's sovereignty. And at the time, this issue of states' rights versus federal encroachment was a very big deal. That was an operation in the 21st century, I mean, the 20th century as well. So a lot of things that happened at the state level were left at the state level. So that's why it was so precedent setting when. John F. Kennedy sent uh, his attorney general down when George Wallace stood in the doorway of the University of Alabama. That was a fair response. And then Dwight Eisenhower called up the army when James Meredith integrated one black man, went to Ole Miss. So when they started getting involved in that, it, the federal government became more active, but people were very, very sensitive to not stepping on the thing called states' rights because they knew the Southerners were passionate about that. And I think in Emmett Till's case, the federal government kept its hands off. Yes. I'm from Chicago originally, and I found it very interesting that Mrs. Till appealed to Mayor Daley, who was a white Irish Catholic, very conservative guy, 
And it sounded like he stood up for her. I inferred that from the from what I can gather from what I gather, Mayor, Mayor Daley did. Yeah, and, pretty and, interesting. You know, you're from Chicago, so you know that you know I have relatives who are in Chicago, and Chicago, along with Cleveland and Milwaukee, they're midwestern cities, but they're also very heavily segregated. But in that instance, Mayor Daley, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna take a take a reach here. Mayor Daley, being Irish and Catholic probably has some familiarity with what it is to be on the margins of things. Okay, so, and of course, Mayor Daley was no pushover <laughs> at all. <laughs> so all, all those things, and then, you know, then, then there was this, just, just this sense that, you know, this goes to the question that Ian asked from, from our virtual partners, you know, there was a sense that, that what happened to Emmett Till, even though people, you know, when, you know, that's it's just awful and went within, carried on and, went back to their barbecue, there was a sense that they, they, this was somehow different. You know, this was just, racism was there and, you know, it was ugly, it's always been a problem and so, so on and so forth. But a 14-year-old kid, a 14-year-old kid who said, what, whistle from Chicago and Mississippi? People had enough sense to sit up and put two and two together. Like, How can a 14-year-old kid from Chicago visiting relatives in Mississippi, what can he do bad enough for that to happen to him to be killed? And again, not just be murdered, but murdered the way he was murdered. So I think part of all that too, according, in, in addition to his own story, all those things must have been motivating and animating Mayor Daly as well. Yes. Uh, I, just an observation, you were wondering about the date on your movie, of those three gentlemen with the my guy there. The, the background car was a 58 in a Biscayne or a low end Impala. But your next slide was an early 60s Chevy. Uh, Chevy. So um, it's a toss because it wasn't on very long, whether it's a 62 Nova or, or, a, or a, it's okay. But there you go. I'll, I'll, I'll take your word for it. That's why, that's, why, that's, that's, why I, that's why I just claimed to say it's not from 1955. We say it was a 58 Biscayne. Yeah. Okay, so but I, just, I just wanted to show that, you know, cars change faster than culture. How about that? <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. So, 50 of his cane, that's three years at the Emmett Till. The culture, the car was different. The culture hadn't moved all that much. Right. That was the point. But thank you. I'm, <laughs> when, I, when I have any more slides of cars, I'll come and find you. <laughs> Fred, did you ever mention to us why Emmett Till had gone down to Mississippi? His mother didn't want him to go. He didn't want him to go. His mother did not want him to go. But, you know, they had relatives down there and they wanted to see him. And so she was very, she was very reluctant to have him go. Um, I, mean, I, just, I mean, I just I just read this last night. She was she was terrified of him going down there and wasn't really thrilled about it. But she, you know, said, OK, well, you know, Uncle Moe's promised to, you know, to keep an eye on him and so forth. So she let him go. And he's a preacher. And he's a preacher. He's a he's a black preacher in Mississippi with a 14 year old kid from Chicago coming to visit, what can go wrong? <laughs> yes, Judy? Re refresh my memory, but is it, is it true that the woman that accused him later changed her mind and said that I really wasn't- Judy's talking about Carolyn him? Bryant. Yeah. Toward the end of her life, Carolyn Bryant either changed her mind or said that she made it, said she made it up. Either way, she said some things, finally came clean and, and essentially the gist of what she was saying was that Emmett Till never said what he was accused of saying. Whatever it was he did, whether it was whistling or saying, hey baby, it didn't happen. And so toward the, I, I don't know if she's even still living, but toward the end of her life, people wanted her prosecuted for setting the whole thing up. But I guess, I think she's passed away, but before she did, she wanted to get that part out of her. She wanted to get that off her conscience. Anything else from the chat, Ian? Nothing else from the chat. Well, we thank you once again so very much for being here with us and, and sharing your heart and soul in your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>